Lance, are you hearing me okay? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Uh, so just really quickly, I wanted to go through and, you know, make the, the official introduction here for you. <laughs> um, so uh, you are Blant Hurt, co-owner of Quality Farm Supply. Um, and uh, you're going to be taking us through um, some of the e-commerce solutions and products that DCCAP provided, uh, the experience for quality farm supply over the competitive advantage of digital transformation. Um, and then um, you're the co-owner of Quality Farm Supply, which is headquartered in Jonesboro, Arkansas. And it is a division of one of the largest providers of parts for production, agriculture, farm supplies and tractor parts uh, and enterprise brands like John Deere, uh, Case IH, AGCO and Macy Ferguson are some of their associated manufacturers to give a little bit of background. Bland, thank you so much for, for just being here and, and taking some time to go through your presentation with us and audience, we appreciate it. So I'll let you um, go ahead and, and start and we'll have the slides come up for you. Sure. Um, yeah, Kathy, thanks for inviting me. And I'll just say this before I start. I had to have a little dental procedure late last week and I'm wearing a, uh, a retainer. So I could take it, uh, so I may stumble a little bit. I could take it out, but I'm based in Arkansas. And if I take it out, I'll be snaggletooth and I'll look, I'll look like even more of an Arkansas hillbilly than, than, than I sound. So uh, bear with me. So yeah, as Kathy said, uh, Quality Farm Supply is a, is a B2B effort, a B2B company. We're a division of a much larger uh, B2B company. Quality Farm Supply is a B2C company. I may have misspoken there. Uh, we use an ERP system by Epicor called Profit 21, and that's a distributor-centric software. Uh, that's kind of the backbone of our business. Um, we sell nationwide, um, and we have four warehouses across the United States to support us. Um, I mean, that said, I mean, we view quality farm supply as kind of a, a, a test kitchen, a way to disrupt our core business, our core B2B business. Uh, we're trying to forge relationships with, with uh, end consumers. It's a little bit of a hedge against the future. Um, I'll just highlight, you know, the difficulty that every company has in disrupting its core business, you know. And, and I, the famous example is Blockbuster Video. And um, I, I don't know if, if, if y'all remember, but you know, I used to go to Blockbuster videos all the time. They used to have locations everywhere and they were kind of the thing, the place to get videos. There aren't any of them around anymore. Um, you know, at the time, you know, Netflix got in that business and I remember subscribing to Netflix when you would, you would order the skits by mail and they'd send you movies by mail. So, you know, Blockbuster, the point is Blockbuster couldn't really make the shift. It couldn't, was trapped by its core business, trapped by its real estate, uh, trapped by what they were doing, and they couldn't really get outside the box and think differently about their business. So anyway, that's a little bit about what, what Quality Farm Supply is for our core business. It's a way to, to try to, um, you know, become a, a little bit of a disruptor for our own business and hopefully save us from the fate of Blockbuster should, should, should things change in that way. Um, you know, I'll note that to this point, you know, our B2C effort is relatively small scale when compared to our core business. So um, that's another difficulty of disrupting yourself when you have a small, uh, just a small effort uh, in the context of a much larger core business that tends to suck up all the resources. So um, that's a bit about quality farm supply. Um, you know, on the next slide, um, you know, I'll note that you know, we've been around since 2012 and we've been through several incarnations. I mean, uh, as such, um, I view us a little bit as a poster child for the way e-commerce has evolved over the past 10 years. Um, we went through an iteration in uh, 2012 to 2014, you know, what I call the Wild West era, where there were many companies uh, offering, you know, purporting to specialize in e-commerce. And some of these were even ad agencies. And and fledgling outfits. Uh, we got hooked up with one of those. Um, you know, that, that served uh, us well for a while, but, you know, eventually, you, as things evolved, we, we outgrew that solution and needed something more robust. So then we kind of morphed into this, what I call the era of custom solutions, where there are fewer, fewer but larger e-commerce companies out there. 
Uh, some of them were providing, you know, their own soup to nuts experience, I call it, with customized coding. You know, they had their own search engine, their own checkout, their own, uh, their own user experience. Uh, and, and really, a lot of this mimics mimic the functionality of stand, what we now know as standardized plugins uh, that become more widely available. So we, we went down that path. Um, you know, all of these were kind of the best options at the time, the best things out there uh, to a degree. Um, you know, we, we've morphed into really what I consider now, I call it the era of platforms uh, in, in B2C commerce. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about that, how we've, how we've evolved into platforms and in, in, in going there, what it, what it means for our business. Uh, the next slide, you know, I'll just... I'll just say our challenges um, as of late last year, you know, we were using one off proprietary e commerce software. When I say proprietary, it, it had a user group, but the user group wasn't very big. So, you know, too often we were on the bleeding edge of software development. Uh, and, and again, much of that software just was available as plugins on these platforms that I'm going to speak about in a minute. Uh, we had a, an unstable user experience. Uh, a lack of internal confidence in our website. And, uh, you know, I'll point out too, and, and in 2018, we started selling on Amazon. And um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna explore that in depth and talk about why we did that. But, you know, the situation in 2019, like we were selling almost as much on Amazon as we were selling on our own website. And uh, I'll talk about why that is as, as we go along here. Uh, so those were our challenges late last year. Um, you know, and, and going forward in my presentation, I'm going to rely heavily, you know, on the next slide, if you would, uh, on, on some concepts that have been advocated by, uh, next slide, um, that have appeared in, um, you know, a publication called Stratechery, uh, and that's, it, it's a newsletter put out by a thinker named Ben Thompson, and I think it's a really good, um, a really good newsletter. I've learned a lot from it, and I'm going to be relying on concepts and talking about some concepts that I've learned from Stratechery. So I don't want anybody to say you're just plagiarizing ideas. I, I am plagiarizing <laughs> Ben Thompson's ideas, and I want to credit him because he's really thought this out, and uh, I, I've learned a lot in going forward. So you know, Ben talks a lot a bit about uh, if you can slip, skip to the Amazon experience slide. I'm not seeing that. Uh, on my screen is it uh, the next slide after that one more slide ahead um, Ben talks a lot a bit back one <clears throat> back one slide anyway I'll, I'll go ahead Ben talks a lot about the Amazon experience and and you know what what Amazon is and Amazon is an aggregator um, and, and what that means is it, it controls the relationship between suppliers and customers. And you can see this is Ben's diagram, but how the customer is kind of just trapped in this, not trapped, but, but encased in this Amazon experience. And the supplier's out here on the side, and the merchant is on the side on the left part of the screen. You see they have no, they have no contact with the customer. So what you have in that environment is you have, you know, a commoditization of products, uh, meaning, you know, you can't really differentiate the products very much in Amazon. You can't, you can't really control the product content. They control that. Uh, you don't have any control of the customer relationship. Uh, you know, you're competing a lot on price. Um, you know, Amazon also charges suppliers, uh, i.e. quality farm supplies, a supplier. They charge a fee for serving as an aggregator. And this fee, you know, is up to 15%. So, you know, further, you know, Amazon starts collecting all this data on what people want. You know, it collects data on our sales. It collects data on the sales of every, every merchant that's on Amazon, every supplier that's dealing with Amazon. So, uh, you know, some people have been shocked at, you know, that Amazon has started their own in-house brands based on this data. Uh, they're not doing that against Quality Farm Spa, but they are doing it, you know, against other, uh, other brands. So, um, you know, that's kind of what Amazon does. And, and that said, um, you know, we, we like doing business on Amazon because it brings us sales, uh, frankly. And, 
you know, I, I was, I was a little surprised at the volume that we've done on Amazon and, uh, you know, um, that, so that's why, that's why we felt like we needed to get in the Amazon game, despite its drawbacks. You know, on the next slide, you know, the other reason, you know, people are drawn into the Amazon web, not just us, but many people, is just the dominance of, of uh, Amazon and e-commerce retail. And this shows, you know, just, it's, it's pretty staggering. You know, they have 47%, I mean, you know, eBay, which we think is law, you know, Walmart and Apple, you know, these others are, 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 are small, uh, comparatively speaking. You know, this Curate retail group you see down here is, is QVC and brands like Zuli and Frontgate and Garnet Hill and others. But, you know, none of them are, all of them are dwarfed by, by the Amazon. Um, you know, so that, 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 that is why we decided to sell on Amazon, you know. Um, you know, ironically, our decision to sell on Amazon and everybody else's decision on Amazon is making Amazon bigger. Um, and I'm not suggesting that we're, we're a big part of that. We're, we're a tiny, tiny, tiny piece, but you know, everybody else that's in that world is selling on Amazon is making them, is making them bigger. Um, you know, the, the, other, the other reason that, that Amazon captures, if you go to the next slide, um, you know, is so many of, of the, you know, of the shoppers start their internet search when they're looking for products, our products in particular, they start their search on Amazon. You know, only 22% start on Google. We tend to think that Google's, you know, the dominant search brand. Well, you know, Amazon's become a big uh, search engine for shoppers, not for people looking for, you know, information necessarily, but for shoppers, it's a big deal. You know, the other thing is just the explosive growth of the Amazon fulfillment centers in the last 10 years um, in the period Quality Farm Supply has been in business. And you can see this, the fulfillment centers growing from, you know, you know a very small in 2000, a small number in 2010 to, to uh, you know, a, a shockingly high number in, in, in 2019 and, and now into 2020. You know, I, I noticed today in the news that, uh, you know, Amazon is talking with Simon Properties, which is a large real estate uh, owner, uh, mall owner and operator about, turning mall locations, uh, empty mall locations into Amazon distribution centers. So, you know, that's what you got going on. And that's why people are drawn, people at Quality Farm Supply get in the Amazon, in the Amazon world. So uh, on the next slide, you know, it comes down to, you know, how do we compete with this? You know, that, that was the question that I asked myself and we began to ask ourselves at Quality Farm Supply. You know, we're seeing this, this scale up in our sales on Amazon. It's rivaling what we're selling on our own platform. You know, and I'll say just how does any company compete with this? You know, this has disrupted, you know, brick and mortar retail. It's affected distributors. It's affected manufacturers. It's, it's um, you know, affected uh, so many businesses. It's been a major disrupting factor across the landscape of American business. Um, you know, I had a question here, you know, how many distribution centers do you think Walmart has? And I ask this because, you know, walmart.com is seen as a, a competitor to Amazon. And, and I like Walmart because it's an Arkansas based company. And, and uh, but you know, Walmart has, has 20 distribution centers compared to Amazon. Uh, so, you know, Ben Thompson has pointed out in Strategery, you know, they're gonna have a hard time competing with, with 20 distribution centers. Now store, they have a lot more stores, but a store is not a distribution center. A store is a store. So uh, in terms of pure distribution centers, they're, they're way behind. Uh, so many companies are trying to figure out, you know, um, how, to, how to cope with the Amazon phenomenon, how to deal with it. Um, so, you know, th this has brought uh, into being what, next slide if you would, what, um, what Ben Thompson at Sertechery is called the anti-Amazon alliance. And, uh, you know, who's in that? And, and you know, it's, it's usual Amazon competitors, you know, face, Facebook shops is a, is a competitor, but Facebook shops is largely used for what he calls discovery, you know, finding products, not necessarily buying them so much, not yet anyway. Uh, you know, Walmart has started their Walmart marketplace where they've, they're enlisting suppliers on walmart.com as supplier distributors. Um, there's, uh, you know, Google and Google search and Google AdWords and Google shops, all that as a competitor to Amazon to a, to a degree. 
you know, all forms of social media are really competitors and a part of this anti-Amazon alliance. And I say that because the social media, the Facebook, the Instagram, Pinterest, uh, Twitter, all of it give brands and companies and like Quality Farm Supply or any other, Nike or you name it, a chance to forge a, a relationship with their, their customers and, and a dialogue with their customers. Uh, that they're not able to have on Amazon. On Amazon, you can't have a dialogue with your customers. They control that dialogue. And I had in here facilitators like PayPal and Stripe and Square and even all these 3PL companies that enable small B2B, B2C companies to, to uh, get in business. You know, the other, the other big piece of the anti-Amazon alliance and what I want to talk about going forward is, is these platforms. And, uh, you know, Ben Thompson calls this, you know, the age of platforms. And, you know, those platforms are Shopify and Shopify Plus, uh, Magento, Big Commerce, WooCommerce, WebPress, Wix Stores, Presto Shop. There, there are a, a lot of others. But, you know, um, you know all, all of these are out there. It's what I, what I call the anti-Amazon allowance. And I would talk about one, one of the platforms in particular. Next slide. You know, this, this again is another Ben Thompson slide. You know, talks about the power of platforms, but you can see what platforms do. But you know, Shopify is basically in here, and it, it's in between. You know, it, it has the merchants, and, and Quality Farm Supply is just a merchant that sits on top of the Amazon platform. And you can see our customers up there. Are you know, a lot of merchants sit on the uh, Shopify platform. Um, you know, about eight months ago, I had never really heard of Shopify. Or if I had, I really didn't know what it was. Um, and, you know, one reason for that, and I don't know down here on this graph, you see developers, you know, uh, DC Cap fits in as a develop Shopify developer. So I'll circle back to that uh, in a little bit. Uh, next slide, if you would. But, you know, basically, you know, Shopify is, is 820,000 third party merchants are on that platform. And, and we're just one of them. We're a spec in the Shopify world. Uh, 218 million people bought products on the Shopify platform, really without even knowing the company existed. Um, I didn't know it exists, existed. Um, so, you know, to compete with Amazon, all of these 820,000 third party merchants are on Shopify have to stand out in some way. You know, really not, not so much on price, which is the Amazon game, but on Google search, on social media, on content, on the overall shopping experience. So that's, that's what Shopify is enabling these merchants like Quality Farm Supply to do. And I, I, I mentioned Shopify, but any of the platforms do that. But I'm just, I'm just singling out Shopify and I'm, I'm gonna talk about uh, a little bit more. So, you know, the next slide is, you know, I, I say, you know, everybody, everybody else except Amazon, whether they realize it or not, is really in the B2C world is really in this anti-Amazon alliance and they're trying to figure out a way to, to survive in it and thrive. Um, so, you know, next slide, you know, if you believe that this is the age of platforms and I do, you know, for us at Quality Farm Supply, it came down to the two most prominent platforms, you know, Shopify versus Magento. And um, I started looking at these and, and I, I'm not a programmer I'll say, but you know, the difference is, is Shopify is a standalone e-commerce comp company where Magento is owned by Adobe. You know, to me, Shopify has more of a focus on e-commerce. And I say perhaps because that, you know, uh, you know, I'm speculating here. You know, could they be more innovative in the years ahead because they're singularly focused on e-commerce? You see over here, you know, Adobe has three divisions, digital media, digital experience and, and publishing. And, you know, a quote over here, a Wall Street analyst who says, you know, we think that Adobe has positioned itself at the center of the exploding market for digital video content and advertising creation and management. You know, and I asked myself, you know, where does Magento fit in this? And, uh, you know, how much resources is Magento going to get from in, within Adobe if they're really positioned in the exploding video content and advertising creation world? And, hey, Adobe has great products. Don't we? So, you know, I also looked at just Shopify's growth and, and you know, I, I pulled up some numbers and just their revenues have just exploded in the last uh, year and, and projected into 2021. 
uh, the stock price has had explosive growth as well. If any of you are, you know, are, are, day, are trading on uh, E-Trade or uh, Robinhood or anything like that, I mean, the stock has just had a phenomenal run, run up. So, you know, I'll say this, other, other platforms are, are faring well as well. You know, big commerce went public recently, you know, in the last month or so, and their, their stock has, has had a good run up. And there's, I think what you see is just, a lot of these platforms have a great amount of mojo right now. I mean, they're just, particularly in this post COVID, not post COVID, this COVID world, where a lot of people are going, my gosh, I've got to get in the e-commerce game. And they're just stampeding to these platforms. And, um, you know, that's what I see, whether it's, whether it's any of these platforms are probably enjoying explosive growth. But, um, you know, basically on the next slide, um, basically at Quality Farm Supply, we decided to make a bet on the future of the Shopify platform. And, um, you know, it's not a perfect platform. I'm sure I will be picking it apart in years. Uh, you know, it may be something that we look back on and say, boy, we were too bullish about that. But right now we had to make a choice on a platform and that's, that's the direction that we went. You know, to get on that platform, we needed a partner. We couldn't do it ourselves. And really our big challenge was our ERP system, our Profit 21 e ERP system, the Epicor product. It's the backbone of our core business. So, you know, what we liked about DC Cap, you know, first of all, you know, they understand the P21 environment and they have a good grasp of that and they know how that works. And that was a big, uh, a big attraction. Um, you know, they have this middleware product called Chloris, which, which really is, is, is uh, integral to that. And, and Majesh, I might just let you weigh in on, on the Chloris and you might talk about what Chloris is and how it works. Uh, I'm, I'm not an expert on it, but um, you are. <laughs> yeah, sure, Blanta. As, uh, as you said, uh, thank you for this. Uh, as you said, Chloris is a middleware which will be play between uh, a P21 environment or any other environment uh, integration platforms and they with Shopify, Magento and all. In Chloris, uh, you can create uh, dynamic flows and map all the fields and you can set up the syncing times when it is needed, whether it should be done dynamic calls or else uh, it should be done every five minutes or every hour or every day like that. Uh, you can set up in the Chloris, uh, uh, Chloris, uh, Chloris platform uh, uh, have th those options and the cron jobs will be run on parallel. If there is any, any error log in the syncs, you can figure out using the logs and then you can correct it in the platform itself and kind of redirect the direct fields. In these types, uh, Chloris plays an important thing. Uh, when it comes to in integration in our quality form supply, we have integrated inventory pricing and with the different warehouses and this plays an important part here. Thank you. Right, thank you, Majesh. And, and um, again, that Chloris was a big, a big piece of why we were attracted to DC. Um, you know, how important of all of, we have to get all of this, all of our stuff integrated into uh, the Shopify platform. Um, and, you know, I was also attracted to DC Cap for, you know, they have uh, user groups and support. I think they do a good job of that. Uh, I was attracted to the ongoing education that they offered. And, had planned to attend one of their conferences out in Los Angeles uh, last spring that obviously didn't get off the ground for because of the COVID situation, but all that was attractive to us to Quality Farm Supply. So we partnered with DC Cap. You know, on the next slide, you know, I want to talk a little bit about the specifics of the qualityfarmspa.com site and you know how what we're doing to differentiate ourselves from Amazon and you know, we had some unique homepage needs and, and, and one of those is we wanted to tout our customer service. And you know, one thing we offer is, is if you go on our site and you, you don't know what to buy, you have questions and we're selling uh, some fairly intricate parts and uh, you know, some things that customers do want to talk to somebody and you know, they, they can talk to somebody, they can order a print catalog. You, know, you can't do that on Amazon. Um, we also had a large inventory of products. That was, that was a challenge. Uh, you know, a lot of product detail for many of our SKUs and uh, that product detail, product descriptions, photographs, line drawings, all, all that specs, dimensions, 
all that is critical to differentiating our products. And that's, that's something that Amazon, uh, the Amazon experience doesn't provide. Um, we had a multi-tiered search options, including a, a make model finder where you could go on and, you know, uh, look up a specific tractor and see what parts we had that are offered for that tractor. That was a, that was a critical thing that again, not on Amazon. Um, we wanted to tout our brands and we have some proprietary brands and uh, we wanted to feature those. Uh, we also want to feature our blog content, which we put a lot of effort into. So those are some things that we, we, we use as differentiators. And those are some things that DC Cap helped us highlight on our homepage and in our selection of our theme and, and setting up our site. Um, I want to talk next a little bit about, uh, you know, the story of our PIM and um, at Quality Farm Supply and really the story of our PIM at, 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 in our core business. And, you know, we, we were late to the party on, on getting into the business of, of, of a PIM and, you know, PIM, Product Information Management System, that's another buzzword that, you know, I think I didn't, hadn't heard of until a few years ago, but, you know, too often we were having, um, we would publish something in print and it would be different from what was on the web. And we just had a, a scattered experience in terms of the content for our, for our 15,000 products. Uh, and really our core business has double that, 30,000 products. So, you know, we, we struggled for years with coming up with a PIM solution that didn't break the bank and um, something that, that was user friendly and we could get our arms around and that integrated with our, with our core uh, ERP system. You know, uh, I'll say this, you know, we, we were not aware that DC cap had a, had a PIM product until we found another. So um, that said, I mean, DC cap was able to integrate the data from, from our proprietary our PIM that wasn't theirs, so to speak. So that, that was a big plus with DC cap. They were able to make all those hooks work and pull data out of the PIM. And we're just stuffing more and more information in that PIM and trying to really, you know, work on attribute filters, work on, work on uh, really making our content sing and getting, getting that uh, data out of there was a, was a big plus that, that uh, DC cap was able to do. And Majesh, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about your PIM product right now. Uh, I'll yield the floor and let you talk about uh, the DC Cap PIM because I don't know anything about it. Yeah, sure, Vlad. Yeah, DC Cap uh, uh, PIM also has a kind of a PIM what we have used in QFS. Uh, like uh, we, you can create uh, multiple channels, and uh, with the multiple channels, we can create. Uh, uh, mul uh, content based on each languages. You can map between different systems with using our PIM and both as well as category products and attributes and what we did for filters and all the, in the um, in the QFS, uh, we do have that. And we do uh, in, in our PIM supports all the platforms like Shopify and Magento as well as big commerce. And we have uh, apps for that and it can be installed to integrate with those systems. It is just a plug and play. If you install that and import all the products in your PIM, then it can be transferred to the, those particular systems. Our PIM has those features as well. And uh, it is like a SaaS based product. You can, it has a, you can give some user roles uh, under your company who can manage content and one can approve the contents and one can publish the contents. Once the content is published, then it will be transferred from the PIM to the appropriate platform. These are some of the features of our Flexi PIM as well. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Majesh. And, you know, again, I'll emphasize it. If you have your own PIM and, and uh, you know, DC Cap will be able to work with your PIM and they were able to do it and, uh, and do it pretty in pretty nifty fashion. So um, I want to just close by talking about where we stand today. And, um, you know, we, we still have a few things to iron out, you know, on, we just only launched about six weeks ago. You know, I'll say this, DC cap is flexible about meeting our needs and, and they stick with, uh, I say with it until it's fixed and it can be anything, whether it's technical issue, whether it's, um, you know, uh, ERP issues, whether it's core software, all that, they're really good about just staying on things until, uh, until they get it right. And uh, they're pretty, they're very dogged about that. And, and we appreciate that. You know, we, we are more confident in the e-commerce platform that we on, we're on. Um, with that confidence comes uh, more of a willingness to invest and lean forward. 
so that that's that's a big plus of, of getting on uh, a more sound footing here with the with the platform. You know, add in here, you know, small things add up. You know, it's it's we've been able to automate our returns, uh, which cuts down some back office paperwork and point clicking and just um, frustration. We have better visibility into shipping. We have better analytics. We have more speed, which is was you know is not to be underestimated these days in e-commerce. And you know, all in all, we have a more stable shopping experience. Um, you know, I also point out that we're using best in class products like Clavio for email marketing. I know Matt has talked a little bit about that. And, you know, we're trying to just line up a, a good portfolio of products that we use. So, you know, my, my last slide and to close, I'll just, you know, I'll just point out, you know, the tools that we have in our arsenal and our anti Amazon arsenal or, you know, Firstly, you know, a big tool we have is the Shopify platform and how it evolves, I put in there. I'm, I'm kind of excited to see where it goes with Shopify, I, they, with the capital they have and the momentum that they have. You know, that said, you know, it's up to us to optimize this platform for our business. You know, uh, we have to learn how to use it. We have to engage. We have to get involved in the user groups on Shopify. We have to learn what's out there and how to, uh, how to maximize it. Uh, they're not going to do it for us. Um, you know, we have DC cap for support and is a critical middleware partner. We think that's important. You know, we have the content or PIM, which we need, you know, I said needs to be continuously improved and we are, you know, committed to continuously improving that content. You know, we have our own distribution footprint. I talked about Amazon's distribution centers. You know, we have assets. I mean, we have four warehouses, uh, that have our specific products. And, you know, we're not, we're not helpless. We, we, we have, ways to fight back and in really potent ways. Um, you know, we have soft skills to offer like product knowledge as conveyed through some phone support to our customers. You know, that's critical. Um, you know, we have all this suite of uh, social media that we can use to engage our customers and to, and, and to form, form relationships with them and to promote our brand. So, you know, I said in the end, you know, we really have no excuse now not to be successful. It's kind of the pressure's on us since we, ha we do have, uh, we are in a better position uh, with this latest uh, uh, iteration, later step up to a new platform. And, you know, all that said, I'll say five years from now, I'm sure the landscape will, will no doubt be changed. I mean, we'll sit, be sitting here and who knows what will, how things will evolve, but I think it's gonna be an exciting time in, in B2C. I think it's I think it's going to be exciting time in B two B for digitization and and e commerce and uh, you know how that fits with traditional retail and traditional distribution and manufacturing all that is going to be uh, you know grounds for a lot of ferment and a lot of uh, a lot of innovation and and uh, you know an exciting time uh, you know but it's also going to be uh, you know a time where people you're going to have to be change receptive to change and. Uh, you know, have your head on a swivel looking out for you know, the next thing, uh, lest you become uh, like Blockbuster. So with that, I'll yield the floor. Thank you, Kathy. Great, thank you so much, Flynn. I mean, I think everyone in e-commerce has the kind of questions that you, you posed, you know, how do we compete with Amazon? How to differentiate? Um, and you, you brought some really great insights, you know, taking the time to make the right decisions for the business and um, certainly some, some good thought behind that. So thank you so much. Um, and also, Blant, I would like to just keep you on for a couple more minutes in the last time we have since we didn't get a chance to uh, get you on the panel earlier. So just a couple questions for you. And sure. then of course, if anybody you know has any other questions, you can put that in the Q&A or the chat. Um, so, I, I wouldn't mind if you would just tell us a little bit about the digital transformation changes that you're seeing, you know, in particular in the farming industry, if you could just talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, some big trends I see, you know, uh, suppliers of, of inputs, and this is real, really where the big dollars are. We sell parts and, and we love the parts business, but, you know, selling inputs like seed and fertilizer and, and all the inputs that go into agriculture, you know, used to be that you bought that you know, from the, from the guy you knew who worked for Monsanto. Now you're seeing uh, suppliers of these, inter, in, you know, a lot of that is moving online and some of these big suppliers are being disintermediated, if I can use that word, or cut out is a better, is a better word. 
Uh, so you're seeing that. You're seeing the rise of the investor farmer. Um, you're seeing platforms like Acre Trader, where you can go buy, anyone can go in and buy a part of a farm and actually own a part of a farm. Uh, you may not know anything about farming. You may not want to know anything about farming, but it's a way for, for capital to get into farming. Um, it's absentee capital, but it's capital nonetheless. Um, you know, really, really what you saw in farming years, five or 10 years ago was a move toward, towards what they call auto steer, which is basically uh, the beginnings of autonomous driving, like, like it's moving into the mainstream, into cars. But hey, it's much easier to drive a tractor around the field uh, autonomously than it is to navigate a car through city traffic. So uh, that was kind of the simplest way for, you know, to, that, that, that was, I won't say a no brainer, but that was pretty easy. So that, that's become a trend in agriculture. Um, you know, you're seeing robotics show up and, and picking and packing and and uh, when I say picking, I'll talk about picking crops. And you know, really, the California market, which we're in, is really a hotbed of a lot of agricultural innovation. And, and um, a lot of that robotics is being spurred on by you know, the, the difficulty of getting immigrant labor that, that they've relied on for years. So kind of macro trends. Uh, you're seeing drones in agriculture. Uh, used to be farmers would walk their land. Now there's walking it but walking it by, with a drone. But, um, you know, the last thing I think is kind of interesting is just this move toward what's called urban agriculture, where, you know, office buildings are being converted into uh, hydroponic farms where floors and, you know, ceilings are being outfitted with uh, uh, UV lights and they're growing vegetables in, in a city environment that, that makes them available at the local farmer's market. Uh, I think that's an interesting trend. I'll say this too, in, 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 you know, farming is, it, it's an older cohort that's in farming. Uh, it's probably, you know, average age is 59, 60, uh, and, and they, they're a little slower on the draw on, on uh, technology. Um, you know, you wonder, younger generation hasn't really moved into farming, and sometimes you wonder if the younger generation is going to move into farming um, at all. So uh, it's been a little slower on adoption than, than other industries. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I can see how there could be a lot of innovation coming for that sector in particular. Um, and then just one, one final question, uh, in your opinion, how do you think the role of the distributor is being, you know, redefined um, in terms of e-commerce? Yeah, I think, I think a lot of it depends on what happens at the, at the retail level and, and the health of our, uh, of the retailer, uh, that, you know, because ultimately so many distributors serve retailers. Uh, we have traditionally. Um, I, I think I think the bond between the in our in the ag industry between the retailer and the farmers. And when I say retailer, I'm talking about the dealer who sells uh, tractors and whatnot. It's going to be fairly strong because they rely on that dealer for parts and support, and um, it's a, it's woven into the fabric of the community. They go there and drink coffee in the morning, or they did before COVID, um, et cetera. But you know, we we as we've also you know uh, partnered with our some of our customers that are that are e tailers and served as their distribution their distributor. Um, you know, I can I can name I could name some of those, but I don't want to really give away our secret sauce. But um, <laughs> you know, we've been <laughs> we, we've been aggressive about going after some of these e tailers and trying to forge relationships with them. But um, you know, and and I, you know, distributors becoming retailers. I mean, you know. The line between what's a distributor and what's a retailer, I, I think, could blur a little bit in the coming years. Uh, you know, yeah. Yeah, that's that's fair enough. And and again, I, I really appreciate you, you know, taking some time just to give even further insight besides, you know, all the great information you gave during the presentation. So thank you so much for that, uh, Blant. It was uh, really great for you to come join us here for our e-session today. So thank you again for that. Um, yes, thank you. And then also uh, just want to say thank you again. Um, you know, we had Majesh Ravi, developer manager at DC Cap, um, as well as Matt Serwin, uh, senior agency partner manager at Clavio. Um, and just want to take a quick moment to thank you guys as well um, for coming on board and, and joining with the previous questions for us. Um, thank you so much again, everyone.